talking about Biafra 50 years after healing, reconciliation, and reintegration. Well, it's no longer news that some 50 years ago, Nigeria uh, fought an a fought a fratricidal war, uh, which is now probably known as the civil war. The question is, how much integration has happened, uh, how much healing and how much uh, reconciliation has happened since that war was fought. That's what we're looking at this morning. We have with us in the studio Chief Sam Obaji, who is the Chairman Merit Oil Limited, a former battalion and brigade commander of the 54 Brigade Biafran Army in charge of the NHS sector. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you, and thank you, viewers. It's been a while. I, I, I don't know if you've ever had cause to talk about this war on television. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you ever had cause to, you know, relieve moments of what actually transpired, uh, maybe how you joined the war 50 years ago? Uh, thank you, Mope. I think uh, to talk about Biafra is very difficult for me. One, it is a war where a lot of my relatives died, a war that my friends died on both sides of the aisle. And um, so when I look back, I have a sense of a passionate feeling, difficult feeling for me. Then I tend to remember some of those who fought with me, those who died on the war front, the fact that myself and some others are alive. It's just a sheer divine will of God. Not because we are very strong or very tactful or defensive. It's just because God didn't want us to die. It was a terrible war. When you now look at what happened after the war ended, uh, we understand that then uh, General Yakubu Gowan, who was still very much alive, said there was no victor no vanquished, in an attempt to try and soften the ground for reconciliation. How much of that would you say has happened since the Civil War? Uh, if you look at Biafra itself, it's good to put it in proper perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I say this is because both General Gowan and Ujuku gave us very conflicting signals. General Gowan himself said at the beginning of his term, that the basis of Nigerian unity did not exist. If you look at his broadcast, you see that he said the basis of Nigerian unity did not exist. And immediately he said that there was a slogan in Zaria, in Kaduna, in Kano, Araba, Araba, Araba. That means let's separate, let's separate. I was born in the north. I have friends there and I grew up there. And at the beginning of that uh, uh, conflict too, Ujuku was saying, Bazamu Raba, we won't separate, we won't separate. And I remember that Ojuku and the Emma of Kanu went into a cocoon to discuss how to ameliorate the situation. So at the beginning, while Gawan was saying Araba, Ojuku was saying, no, we won't separate. But later on, Ojuku was saying, nah, let's separate. And Gawan was say, saying, let's have united Nigeria. Go on with one Nigeria. You see the conflict. So both leaders gave conflicting signals. So the followers now had to fend for themselves and look for what is in the ground. What was then on the ground was bloodshed. Riots everywhere, killing, bloodshed everywhere. People were being massacred. And then people have to look for self-defense. And that was exactly what happened. It wasn't that Ujuku talked people into war. Uh, or whatever it is. it is, because what was on the ground was not comfortable for human existence. You cannot sit back and you see people being slaughtered and you don't do anything. That was why some of us joined the Biafran War. Uh, yes, I was a, uh, a brigade major, I was a brigade commander, and I rose to the rank. How, how old was I? I was just about 21 years old. And I, because of the successive wars, I was elevated to brigade commander. Um, I was shot so many times. It wasn't fun to fight a war. And I thank God the war ended the way it ended, peacefully. I, I'm wondering, I mean, first, what were you doing before the war? Yes. Oh, well, I, when <coughs> I left high school, yeah. I, uh, I, was, uh, I was the last person hired by Nigerian ports. 
and I was an accounts clerk at Nigerian Post in Port Harcourt. So immediately the crisis started, it started in 66 and then 67. Um, I saw my people come back from the north, uh, some of them maimed, some killed, and uh, it was very touching, extremely very touching. And uh, we tried to see what could be done. But there was absence of leadership in Nigeria at the time. Uh, there was no national ideal as to how to bring the country together. Uh, leadership were on their own. Different leaders were on their own. We didn't have consensus. Leadership was very, very lacking. And that was created the war. Well, I mean, it's 50 years now. I mean, I was trying to bring you to when uh, General Yakubu Gowon talked about the three hours of re re reconstruction, rebuilding, and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, and he also said there was no victor, no vanquish, to try and soften the ground for some of this, uh, for the reconciliation moves that were supposed to happen between Nigeria and, uh, you know, people who tried to secede. The question now is, looking at how far we have come since the end of the Civil War, uh, have we really made much progress, especially when we look along the lines of conversations that still happen right now in the Southeast? You still have IPOP, even though they have been, uh, they have been, uh, prescribed as a group, uh, but we still know that agitations are still there. People still feel very strongly about either seceding or, you know, asking for um, restructuring, that's the other language that's commonly used, not for secession, but perhaps in such a way that we go back to the regions, because if, right now people believe that the country is not as productive as it ought to be. What are your thoughts on how Nigeria has progressed since when the war ended? Okay, let me give you a background information. I commend Gowan for his policy of reconciliation, the three hours they yeah. call it, reconciliation, rehabilitation, and, um, and the other one. Uh, but I'll tell you what happened then. Some of them were just mere slogans. I commend General Bisala, particularly General Bisala. General Bisala, at the end of the war, implemented reconciliation. Because when the Biafran troops came out, he received them open arms. But when they went to the third marine commander under Abbasanjo, some of them were killed. And we have records, they were killed. So some of us who had not come out at the time, who monitored what was going on, went in, into our cocoon. And I tell you something, General Bisala helped in the process of ending the war peacefully. Because if he didn't, some of the remnants of the Biafran troops were ready to go into a guerrilla war instead of just handing themselves over to be killed. What happened with Third Marine Commando was unfortunate. You know, Third Marine Commando was in Port Harcourt and uh, Uweri. And Bisala was in Enugu. He commanded the First Division. And Obasanjo commanded the Third Marine Commando. And... Uh, the first commander of 3rd Marine Commando was Benjamin Adekunle. Now, Obasanjo took over from Benjamin Adekunle. And during the process, after the war, they, besides the fact that Biafra soldiers who came there initially were killed before the war intervened, they had a policy of taking over and appropriating the property of Ibus in Port Harcourt. Even though in Kanu, Audubaku, gave back the property to Igbos. In Jos, they gave back the property to Igbos. All over the country. But in Port Harcourt, where Obasanjo was the commander, Igbo properties were taken over. Up to now, they call it abandoned property. I've never seen in the world where, after the war, you say, oh, you cannot get your property back when you are preaching reconciliation and rehabilitation and uh, whatever. So the, the slogan of the three hours by Gowan was only implemented by the Bissala. The other commander didn't give a hoot. I can tell you that. Yeah, but I mean, moving on from there, as a country, I mean, we know that even right now in the political equation of things, mm -hmm. there is still the complaint, complaint of marginalization mm -hmm. uh, from the from southeastern leaders. Mm -hmm. w would you say that, you know, there has been enough to integrate uh, people from the southeast into the country d d as a deliberate government policy, not just as an uh, yes. as, as an economic. I, I understand what yes. you're saying. Uh, 
they haven't been enough. They haven't been enough at all. I think that the government has a policy of federal character. And that federal character has been not implemented at all. If you go to the ministries, you go to the parastatals, you see what is happening. You know, that means that they are not taking the federal character issue seriously. If we can, if we want to build a, a good nation, if we want to build a very nation, a strong nation, we must integrate everybody into one. We must have a national ideal. A country without a national ideal is just wallowing in, uh, in the wilderness. If you take, for example, some of the great countries we have today, starting from our neighbor, Ghana, when Nkrumah was there, Nkrumah built a national ideal. Every Ghanaian saw themselves as Ghanaians. They spoke as Ghanaians. They were proud of their nation. But you cannot be proud of your nation if you are marginalized, if you can't get a job when others are getting jobs. You know, it's a serious thing. And I call on the federal government to look back again and see if the federal parastatals and agencies are really implementing federal character, which is part of the federal policy. They are not. And this is why everybody is worried. We are not saying give preference to one person or the other. But take everybody, whether they are Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, Shekiri, Lupe or so, as the same one and indivisible people and build a national ideal. They will all melt into it. America, they call it melting pot. Let us have a country that's a melting pot. Whatever nationality you are, whatever any group you are, you come into Nigeria, you become one Nigeria. Just like we, uni we get united during football matches. Let us be united in the ministries. Let us be united in the agencies. Let us be united everywhere. So we need leadership. We need strong leadership. And if people say, ah, we need strong institutions. But it's strong leadership that builds strong leadership, uh, institutions. If you, at this time now, we need strong leadership that can give us strong institutions. And immediately we have strong institutions. We can now checkmate corruption. We cannot checkmate all the avarice and all the difficulties we are facing in the country. Right now, we need strong leadership. And we need this country to now develop a national ideal. And that national ideal is what is going to bring, uh, what is going to build a big nation for the, all of us, you and I. Mm. Uh, just wondering, I mean, considering just how strongly you felt about Biafra then, and you say it's still an emotional topic for you. I didn't hear you. You say that the, to discuss in Biafra is still an emotional topic for yes. you. I'm wondering, do, 50 years after, do you now identify as Nigerian? You know, after the Civil War, I went to the United States to study. And while I was in the United States, the, the feelings or the effect of the war was still in me. I tell you a story. While I was City College, I was doing an assignment. I was up in a 10-story building. And it was um, New Year. And they were having firecrackers. I thought the enemy was attacking me. Oh. I almost jumped through the window looking for my gun. It took me time to come out of that. Now, we don't want that to happen to our youths again. We don't want any more war. What we want is peace. Now. We have to create environment for peace. I, I tell you something, some of us who fought the war are the greater proponents of one Nigeria. I'm telling you that. So those who fought the war are great proponents of one Nigeria because they don't want to see another war. Now, but people don't want peace in a graveyard. People want real peace. If you don't create that environment whereby people will be proud to be Nigerians, they go back and start doing something like you have IPOB, you have Masop, and you have all the other people, ethnic groups. You know, we have to be careful. We have to really be careful because Nigeria is for all of us. And because Nigeria is for all of us, we want to see Nigeria succeed. Personally, I want to see Nigeria succeed. There's nothing like peace. If you leave this country, you know you have no other country, but you are Nigeria. And that's why you pray for Nigeria every day. We don't mean political prayer. You go to mosques and churches, they say they are praying. Some of them are praying politically. We want genuine prayer. If we pray genuinely, God will answer our prayer and give us a good nation. And that is very, very important. 
for me, I'm a Nigerian. I'm a strong Nigerian. And I'm a believer now in the strength of one Nigeria. Because in one Nigeria, we can do a whole lot of things. We can aspire to be another America, United States of Africa. We can be stronger than Germany. We can be stronger than South. We have potential to be a great nation. Why are we not a great nation? Because of this, the fault lines, the Nigerian fault lines, ethnicity and religion. Those are fault lines that help to, that corruption leverages on ethnicity. Corruption leverages on religion. Uh, on religion. And that's it. They continue to try because if somebody is corrupt and you want to jail him, and they say, ah, he's from so, 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 jailing him because of so, 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 so. Ah, the government is jailing this one because it's, so, it's jailing because it's political party. So, no. But if we have a national ideal and we see ourselves as one Nigeria and we downplay religion, not that religion is very important for our spirit and soul because we want to go to heaven. Ethnicity means we must identify with that ethnic group. But we must find a way whereby the diversion we have in ethnicity, the diversion we have in religion, we help of in nation, in nation building. That's very, very important. And I think that those in the orientation, those in the Ministry of Information, should look at this seriously and see how we can use our diversity to build a great nation. Mm. I, I know that, you know, I don't know how much of this history, for instance, I, I, it, is, it is really commendable uh, to, to uh, and it's remarkable the resilience of our brothers who went through the war. A lot of them lost everything. So you talked about those who were not able to get their property back in places like Port Harcourt. Uh, but if you still look at the economic prominence of the Southeast and how they have been able to come back since after the war, uh, you, you really have to commend the resilience of, of Southeasterners. However, um, you know, you, you have the questions to ask are as to how the country, how Nigeria itself has documented the war and how we're telling that story to our children. Do you think that um, we are transmitting the lessons that we learned from that bloody, uh, needless war, so to speak, that brothers fought? Are we transmitting the lessons to generations that are coming up? It's a good question. If you go to the uh, United States, take for example Washington, D.C., you visit the war memorial. You visit the Jewish memorial. And when you go there, you see the horrors of the World War II. And the horrors of World War II make the youth to say, never again. It's a slogan. They say, never again, because these things were documented. Unfortunately, what happened in Biafra was after the end of the war, you know, Biafra was on the verge of developing rockets. They had rockets, but they were trying to develop delivery. If they were able to deliver, develop the trajectory where they can deliver their rockets, Biafra could have been a great nation. But when they had what they call research and production, where all the scientists came together and we are researching on so many things, when the government came, they took the water and the baby and threw them away and destroyed everything. So there's no war memorial. Young people don't see what people suffered during the war. If the young people see what happened during the war, people won't talk about war. If the government now leveraged on what happened then and tried to recreate and help this, some of the creations, ingenuity of Biafra, I tell you, Nigeria could have, no, would not be importing arms. It's because they just felt, oh, this is uh, Biafra. We don't want to talk about Biafra. This, uh, but there were certain good things about Biafra. You know, the war was not good. But there were some creations that we needed to develop in Biafra. Do you understand? The ingenuity of the Boman, the creation of the Boman. You know, we need to develop it. Because in this big nation, the Fulani, Asa Fulani have their own strength. The Yorubas have their own strength. The Boos have their own strength. If we bring all this strength together, we build a big nation. We shouldn't say, oh, don't, don't forget about these people. Don't put them in this ministry. Don't put them here. You are marginalizing ourselves. It's just like somebody who has married a woman. Your family, your wife is so intelligent and brilliant. And you say she shouldn't work. She shouldn't develop her career. You are cutting your 
access by half. Everything now has to depend on you. Well, pay you are working. Your husband is working. Both of you are working. Both of you come together. When you come home, you now, you now think and ex exchange ideas. Those exchange ideas help the growth of the family. And that's what Nigeria needs. We shouldn't marginalize anybody. Whether they are minorities, whether they are majority, we shouldn't marginalize. We should bring everybody together on the table and discuss how to move forward in this country. Soon, we'll be a great nation. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's talk for, I mean, the generality of all of us. What about in the Southeast itself? What would you say the sentiments are still in the Southeast? And would you say the Southeastern leaders, let's even talk about the governors, for instance, are harnessing or even, uh, yeah, harnessing the feelings of the people and trying to see how it is that they too can do right by their people? The problem we have in the South is particularly is that just like in Nigeria, everything politicized. If you are APC, you, you think great of what the PC people are doing. If you are PDP, you think of what PDP is doing. And I know the sentiment is not good. The people are feeling marginalized. They feel they are not part of this country. But we think that with good leadership, we can be integrated into this camp properly. And the advantages of their strength will be taken care. Will be taken up. We will we, now bloom to the benefit of other other ethnic groups. I do not think that we can develop Nigeria in isolation of the other people. We need everybody on board to work a nation to build a nation. The South East, yes, they as they have their strengths, but I know their feeling. Their feeling is not good. They feel they are not, their children are not getting jobs. And the roads, if you go to the southeast, you cry because there are no roads. It takes time. It's just this time Bugari came that he's trying to build uh, Niger Bridge and all that. But this has been the, the offer for such a long time. I commend Bugari because he's doing something that people are seeing. Now they're talking of railroad. You know, the road in, uh, in the southeast. I saw the president when, during the campaign, he talked about railroad. If he start the railroad, then we need, we see, people will feel that they are being assimilated, they, are being, they belong to this great nation. It's very important. So people are saying, in my own language, they said, That is, if you share properly the booty, there will be no anger. Everybody will be happy. They will be happy with the nation. They will be part of the nation. And that's what we're advocating for, nothing more. Hmm. We don't say treat people uh, uh, differently or give them, uh, 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 consider them uh, above others. No. Give everybody a, free, a level playing field and everybody come on board and we become, uh, uh, we love each other and we grow as a one nation. That's very important. Hmm. So what would you say, you know, to young people coming up who don't know much. I will tell you something that I only, you know, read about the war in a work of fiction done by Chimamanda Adichie. That was sometime in 2008. Um, what would you say to young people who want to know more about what happened and perhaps how we can avoid such a conflict in future? You know, some years back, the Emma of Kanu, Chule Lamido, in a speech he gave, he said, we have to be careful how we marginalize people because of Biafra. Because in future, young people who didn't know about Biafra and don't have no reference point, and when you treat them that way, they will carry arms and start another war. God forbid that happens. But that statement is very, very pertinent. It's a very pertinent statement that because we don't have uh, memorials, we don't have uh, where people go and see what happened in the war. And what they're seeing is how we are treating them now. And how we are treating them now is just marginalization. And they said, no, I have to fight. This is why people are leaving the country and they say they're doctors, they say they're not going to get a job, they take a job somewhere else. It's not good for the country. There's a brain drain on this country. Doctors, engineers are leaving. If you get to the uh, uh, United States, within the New York uh, area, within the Maryland, Washington area, 
they will have concentration of Nigerian doctors. So a final sentence on this, sir? Yes. A final sentence. Do you want to leave a final sentence? I should. Okay. Nigeria should have a national ideal. That national ideal, everybody will key into that national ideal, irrespective of tribe, irrespective of ethnicity. And we can, if there's corruption, we all come together to fight it. It's that a is my statement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Early this morning. Chief Sam Obaji is a Chairman Merit Oil Limited, a former battalion and brigade commander, 54 Brigade Biafran Army, in charge of Onicha sector.